tonight I want to share with you a very powerful teaching of the Arizal, Rabbi Isaac Luria. But let me begin with an old anecdote about a shul, a synagogue, in which there was fighting every single Shabbos. Half of the congregants believe that you have to stand during the Kaddish, and the other half believe that you have to sit during the Kaddish. And each week there was another dispute. Do we stand during the Kaddish or do we sit? One Shabbos, the fighting was so intense that people simply got into a physical fist fight. And the rabbi said, enough is enough. This is not how a congregation can run. The next morning, he decided to do something which he thought would finally solve all the problems. They went to visit an old age home. The old age home, there was an old Jew, David, who was 104 years old, who was from the original founding fathers of the shul. And the rabbi felt this man who was there right in the beginning, will finally be able to resolve this weekly quarrel, whether we sit or we stand during the Kaddish. And so the rabbi and delegates of both sides came to this old Jew in the old age home. And the first team presented its case. They said, our dear Jew, you were here in the beginning is it not true that during the Kaddish, the whole congregation would stand? And the old man thinks for a few moments and he says, I can't say that that was the tradition. The other team jumps up, you see, you see we were right. And they turn to him and they say, our dear Jew, isn't it true that from the beginning of this community, When the synagogue was founded, everybody was sitting during the recital of the Kaddish. And the man says, no, I cannot tell you that that was the tradition. And the other team starts screaming, you see, you're wrong. And they get into a whole argument and screaming, you have to sit, you have to stand, you have to sit and stand. They're screaming and hollering at each other. And the old man perks up and looks and he says, ah, that was the tradition. There's a verse in the portion of Shaiftim. Bring up source number one in your curriculum. Please, right below the video, you have a PDF document. And the Torah says in Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verse 8, Parsha Shaiftim. Ki yipole mimcha davar lemishpat. If a matter of justice will be concealed from you. Bein dam ledam, bein din ledin, u bein nega lenega. There will be the question between blood and blood, between verdict and verdict, between plague and plague, divrei rivais bisharecha, words of dispute in your cities. You should rise up and ascend to the place which the Lord your God will choose. What is the meaning of this literally? It means... Sometimes there is a dispute in Jewish communities and among Jewish courts. What is the proper halacha? What is the proper way of Jewish law? It could be a question, as the Torah says, about blood. Pure blood or impure blood. It can be a question about various verdicts and monetary issues. It can be a question concerning plagues and leprosies, whether ritual or monetary issues. There may be disputes and debates, and the verdict is unclear. What then has to be done? The local courts in the Jewish communities cannot solve the disputations. What happens? Here the Torah says you should rise up and go to Jerusalem. There they had what we would call the Jewish Supreme Court, or in its original name, the Sanhedrin. 71 members of the highest authority of Israel. And they were presented with this dispute from a community, from a city that couldn't be resolved locally. 
and they would give the final verdict of how the issue should be dealt with. Now, let us see the interpretation of the Arizal. The Arizal, Rabbi Isaac Luria, was one of the great Kabbalists, or the greatest Kabbalist of Jewish history. He lived in the 16th century in the holy city of Tzfas, of Safat, where he taught Kabbalah for two years. He passed away at a very young age, at the age of 36 or 38, in the year Shin Lamed Beis, 1572. There are many works of the Arizal, Rabbi Yitzchok Luria, Rabbi Isaac Luria. One of them is known as Lakute Torah, a commentary on the weekly portion, a commentary on the Chumash, and on the Tanakh. In the portion of Shoftim and Lakute Torah, the Arizal, Rabbi Isaac Luria, presents the following powerful interpretation to the verses just quoted. We have it here in our sources. Let's learn it inside. Please bring up source number two in your curriculum, right below the video in your PDF curriculum. Zagda Ariza l'kutatayda l'hariza. Omru Rabbi Seinu Zal, our sages teach us in the Midrash. Shashalu malachi asharis l'hakadosh baruch hu b'shah the angels turned to God during the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash of the Holy Temples in Jerusalem and they asked him the following question. Rebbein HaShaloi, the master of the universe. Kasafta b'seira secha v'shafach es damay v'chisao ba'afar v'kan k'siv shafchu damam kamayim ki damam b'seicha v'goymer. You have written in your Torah, in the book of Leviticus, there's a commandment that when a chicken, a kosher fowl, is slaughtered. Its blood is spilled. The blood must be covered with earth as a reflection of honor and reverence to life and the life of the animal, the life of the chicken. And here, it says their blood was spilled like water referring to the thousands of thousands of Jews, men, women, and children who were slaughtered and their blood was spilled and nobody cared to cover their blood with earth. You wrote in your Torah, you gave a commandment that you're not allowed to slaughter an animal and its offspring, its child, the same day. And yet during the destruction, the same day, children and parents were murdered. As another Madrish tells the story and says, Chana and her seven sons, in the famous story of Jewish martyrdom, were slaughtered on the same day. The Torah you commanded that we're not allowed to kill a parent and a child animal the same day. But how many parents and children were exterminated the same day in Jewish history? And the angels continued. You wrote in your Torah. If there is a nega, if there is a leprosy in a home, sometimes, as the Torah says in Leviticus, there is leprosy on a body, leprosy in a garment, leprosy in a home. In the walls of a home, there are symptoms of a leprosy. So the Torah says the Kohen, the priest, should say, empty out the house, take out all the furniture, take out all of the expensive items in case the house is quarantined and deemed impure and must be destroyed. None of the precious items or furniture in it should be affected by it. That's the commandment. Empty out the house first. Caring for our money, our finances, our com- our commodities, our merchandise. Vikan and here Vayistrufu Basel Kimvakolkle Mahmadala Ashkis. The verse says they burnt the house of God and all of its vessels, all of its precious vessels were completely destroyed. 
So the angels turn to God and say, the justice, the laws of ethics, the values that you yourself have transcribed in your Torah as a blueprint for the Jewish people, how they should live. How did you allow history? How did you allow these very people to suffer in these very ways that you have prohibited? Number one, their complaint was, there is respect for blood even of an animal. It has to be covered with earth. How much Jewish blood was spilled, nobody bothered to bury the blood. You commanded parents and children shouldn't be slaughtered the same day. In the animal kingdom, how many parents and children were slaughtered the same day among the Jewish people? And finally, you commanded them to have respect for the furniture in a home, and yet you allowed the temple and all of its precious vessels to be destroyed and go up in flames. Omar lahem HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God responds to the angels and he says, the Medrash says, is there peace in the world? Since there's no peace, there's nothing else. Because there's no peace, because there's no unity, because there's no cohesiveness, somehow everything goes wild. Everything is chaotic. Comes Darizal and says, this message the Torah is intimating to us with this verse in Shaft. And the reason explains this. means when a matter of justice will be concealed from you. The reason explains what the Torah is addressing is when you will study history. And you will wonder, you will be astonished about the justice of history. You'll wonder about the difference between blood and other blood. This is the first question of the angels. When it came to the blood of chickens, you commanded the Jews to cover the blood with earth. Practice till today, called the mitzvah of Kisu Yadam. When a chicken is slaughtered, the blood must be covered. Or a chaya is slaughtered. Certain animals are slaughtered. The blood must be covered. And yet Jewish blood was not covered. The second pella, the second yipole, the second wondrous question you'll have is, din ledin. The difference between one verdict and another verdict. Hainu oisevez b'nai kanal. Whence the difference in verdicts? When it comes to the animal, you can't slaughter the mother and the child, the father and the child. When it comes to the human being, it came to the Jew. How many parents and children were slaughtered the same day? Bein din ledin, how does the verdict change? Your third question, bein nega lenega, between leprosy and leprosy. Hainu v'tziva hakayin k'nisker Here again the distinction. When it comes to the laws of leprosy in the Torah, the Kohen says, evacuate the home before you destroy it. But how many holy temples were destroyed completely with all the furniture inside? And you wonder, how can this be? The response to this is, matters of dispute in your cities, it's the fighting, it's the quarreling, it's the disputations and the wars and conflicts in your cities. The lack of peace that causes all of this chaos and destruction. O Messiah, therefore the Torah continues and concludes, You must rise and ascend to the place, which place? Jerusalem. Jerusalem is defined in the book of Tehillim as the city the city which unites and connects all the Jewish people together. There all the Jewish people became friends. 
and through Torah practiced in Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, the people will unite and will reconcile their conflicts and fights and peace will be restored. So the Holy Arizal is telling us what's the message in this verse. Sometimes we look at our past, we look at our present, and we see realities that boggle one's imagination, their mind staggering, they overwhelm the mind, and one asks, where is the justice? How can this be? And the response is, It's often caused because the lack of unity because the absence of peace, because the wars and the conflicts and the fighting and the disputations and the animosity and the hatred and the hunting down one another. This is sometimes the cause of the greatest calamities. And the solution is you must go up, you must rise beyond yourself, you must go to that place, Jerusalem, the city of peace, Yerushalayim, Yerushalom, the city of Shalom, the city of peace, it has the energy to bring people together. You must rise to a state of consciousness represented by the concept of Jerusalem, of unity, which will eliminate this disastrous chaos. There is a very powerful teaching of the Sfasemes. The Sfasemes was the second spiritual master of the Hasidic dynasty of Ger, the second Ger Rebbe. He says, go back to the genesis of Jewish history. The first Jewish leader was Moshe Rabbeinu Moses. And the first story we know about Moses is he grows up and he goes out to his brothers and the first day, what does he see? He sees an Egyptian beating a Jew. And what does he do? He looks here, he looks there, and he sees nobody is present. And he strikes the Egyptian, he kills the Egyptian and hides him in the sand. And that way he saves the Jew from being beaten to death by the Egyptian. And what does the Torah continue? The second day Moses goes out again. This time he sees a fight, but it's not between Egyptian and Jew. It's between two Jews. Two Hebrews are quarreling with each other. And Moses turns to one of them and says, Why will you strike your friend? And in typical Jewish fashion, the man looks at him and says, Who appointed you as the judge, as the rabbi, as the mentor to tell us what to do? Are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? And Moses now is frightened. The first day he's not overcome by fear. First day he's decisive, he knows what to do. Unfortunately, there are times when You have to kill. If somebody innocent is being threatened to be murdered, if you're going to be passive, an innocent human being will die, it's your responsibility to save him. And if that means killing the murderer, sometimes moral violence is the only thing that will save an innocent person from immoral violence. Moses is determined, is decisive, and he ends the problem. The second day, he's frightened. And he has to leave Egypt. He has to flee because Pharaoh hears about it. Pharaoh hears about what he did to the Egyptian. And he has to flee. And he leaves Egypt. He goes to Midian. And the Sfasemas explains that these two days and these two events represent two components of Jewish history. Jews suffer from two things. Number one, from anti-Semitism. That's the first day Moses goes out and he sees an Egyptian beating a Jew. But we suffer from something else the second day. And that's from inner fighting. From inner disrespect. From inner conflict. For the first solution. For the first problem, Moses has a solution. He fights the Egyptian. What happens on the second day? He's scared. He he doesn't have a solution for this. And he has to flee Egypt. And as Fasema says, we see that what happens the second day is a recurring problem and a recurring issue that's not easily solved in Jewish history. There's a fascinating verse I want you to look at. Bring up up source number three in your curriculum. It's a verse in the book of Hesheia, the book of Isaiah. 
Perek Dalet Posek Yud Zayin, Chavur Atzabim Ephraim Hanachloi. The Prophet says in the name of God, Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim, is connected to idols. He is connected to idols. Leave him alone. What does Hanachle, what does it mean to leave him alone? So the Medrash explains source number four, and it's quoted in Rashi on the verse. In Hoshea and Isaiah, take a look. Mesechta Derech Eretz. Rebbe Lezer HaKapar Oimer, Rabbi Eliezer, Rebbe Lezer the Kapar says, Ehevu es hashalom v'sinu es hamachloikas. Love peace and loathe fighting. God Allah Shalom peace is great. Shafilu Bishar Shi Yisrael Oivdin Avay Dezara. Vyesh Shalom Benehem. Oimira Kadish Baruch Hu Einrit Saini Liga Behem. Even when Jews are worshipping idols, but they have peace between them, God says, I do not want to touch them. Shanemar Chavur Atzabim Ephraim Hanachloi. Ephraim may be connected to idols, but leave him alone because Chavur, because the Jews are united. When there's peace between the Jews, God says, leave them alone, I'm not going to touch them. I, they're entrenched in idolatry. They're entrenched in paganism. But they're united. They love each other. They're at peace. Hanachloi, leave them alone. That's how the Medrash explains this verse. Imagine. Idolatry is considered the worst sin in the Torah. But God says if they're united, chavur, they're b'chaburah, they're getting along, there's love between them, leave them alone. But when there's a fight, then the verse says, now their hearts are divided, now they'll be found guilty. How we learn from here that peace is great, and fighting is despised. Kate said that Medrash continues. For example, a city, a community in which there's fighting will be destroyed. When there's fighting in a city, it can cause to bloodshed. A synagogue that's filled with fighting will be destroyed. A home, a family that's filled with fighting, will be destroyed. The sages said, when there's a fight in the home, it can lead to immorality and promiscuity. Very sharp words, hard to repeat. Two courts in a city, two Jewish courts in a city, but they're fighting with each other. They will perish. The sages said, When there's fighting in Jewish courts, in other words, among those spiritual authorities who are supposed to uphold the justice and the beauty and the ethics of the law, and they're fighting, it creates destruction in the world. This explains another very tragic and fascinating midrash. Open up your next source, number five. The midrash says, "Vayikri Rabba, Matzinu Tinoikas Bebeis David, Bemei David Atchelay Tamu Tamchet." The children in the times of King David, who did not taste the taste of sin, and they knew how to expound the Torah, 49 ways showing how something is impure, and 49 ways showing how things are pure. In other words, they were brilliant masters of Torah who understood the intricate details of Torah wisdom and Torah knowledge, Sometimes the same law can be applied and understood in so many different ways and pathways, and these children mastered it. 49 reasons why something is pure and 49 reasons why something is impure. Same thing, same reality. But after all this praise, the soldiers, the Jewish soldiers in the time of David would go out to war and they would fall, they would die in combat why such great scholars so much Torah learning the children were saturated with Torah why did they lose their wars the reason is because they would gossip about each other they quarreled with each other they spoke badly about each other and that caused them to fall in war and the Medrash continues the generation of Achav one of the kings of Israel, 
He trained a nation of idolatry. Everybody was worshiping idols. There were very few faithful Jews left. Elijah the prophet was the great prophet fighting Achav. But But since there was no gossip among them, they weren't informing upon each other. They would go to combat and they triumphed. They prevailed. This is the same idea. Chavur, Chavur, Ephraim, Chavur Atzavim, Ephraim, Hanachloi. Ephraim may be connected to idols like the generation of Achim. God says, let them win the war. This is the power of love. This is the power of unity. Because the Jewish people are like a single body. We are like a single organism. When I'm fighting with another Jew, when I hate another Jew, when I'm denigrating or insulting or putting down or embarrassing or actively involved in a quarrel against another Jew, I may think I'm fighting against a stranger, a second person, but essentially I'm destroying myself. And I'm destroying the entire structure of the Jewish people because we're like one body. The Talmud says the Jewish people are like one body. I may beat my left arm because of something wrong it did, but by beating my left arm, I'm also affecting my right arm. And I'm affecting every other part of my body. There is a type of disease indeed, biologically, we call it autoimmunity. When the organism of the body does not recognize all of its components as part of a cohesive whole identity... And it starts fighting against its own cells, against its own tissue, against its own organs. It doesn't recognize them as being part of it. And it becomes self-destructive. And that's what disunity among the Jewish people creates. Because we are all one. We are all essentially connected. We cannot afford to be fragmented and separated. We can have differences of opinions but not hate and fighting and disputes to the point of informing and gossip and negative energy and animosity. That's destructive for everybody. There's something else. As our sources explain, when the Jewish people are united, is like a fortress, and the fortress does not allow any negative energy to penetrate. So even if the Jewish people are not on a very high spiritual level, but the unity, the love, creates a link It's a wall that doesn't allow any negative energy to come in, pierce through the wall. But if there's a breach, if there's an opening, then negative energy can penetrate, can come in. The Jewish people had two temples and they were defeated, they were both destroyed. The Jews were defeated and exiled twice. The first time, first the ten tribes were exiled by the Assyrian king, and 130 years later, the other two tribes were exiled and the first temple was destroyed. That was caused because of the divide between the tribes. After Solomon's death, The Jewish people divided. And that division is what ultimately led to the catastrophes that first had the ten tribes exiled and then the final two tribes exiled. That was the first defeat. And then there was the second defeat, the second exile. The second temple was destroyed, not by the Babylonians, but by the Romans a few hundred years later. And here again... It was caused by the Romans, but the internal cause, which allowed the Romans to do it, was tremendous factionalism and fighting that went on among the Jews themselves, which allowed the Romans to be able to achieve their goals. Look at the last source, number six. The Gemara says in Mesech the Yumad Aftesamid Beis, the second temple, they were involved in Torah and mitzvahs and charity. Why was it destroyed? Because there was baseless hatred. Baseless hatred against another Jew is equivalent to the three great treacherous sins of idolatry, of adultery, and of murder.
They tell the story about the saintly Chafetz Chaim, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Hakoyin of Raden. Chafetz Chaim, in his community, there was a big fight going on between two people. And one man had a healthy ego, he was wealthy, he was respected, and he was mercilessly fighting against another person. And in the middle of this fighting, this wealthy man's child fell ill. And his illness became very severe and the child was deteriorating and was in real serious danger. And the Chafetz Chaim went to visit the parent, the father. And he went into him and said, you know, look what happened to your child. Look how ill your child is. Don't you think you should stop the fight? Don't you think it's time to end the war? And the man told him, he said, hard to repeat, but this is what he told him. He said, I'll have my child die, but I'm going to win. This is what can happen to the human ego. Fighting hate in a family, in a community, in a city, in a people. In the beginning, one doesn't recognize how destructive it is. But it's like a silent cancer, which eats up at the core of the, of the organism eats up at the very stuff that makes it whole and sometimes intoxicates people to a point where there's no going back. They feel that their very existence is on the line if they don't win the war. They become irrational. They don't see the bigger picture. They become so entrenched in the need to win and become triumphant that they become insane. Rabble-rousers sometimes become insane. Their egos take over. One of the very famous tragic fights in Jewish history happened between two great rabbis who lived in uh, the 18th century in the 1700s. One was Rabbi Yonis in Eipschitz and Rabbi Yaakov Emdin. Rabbi Yaakov Emdin, who was a great rabbi, a scholar, author, accused Rabbi Yonis in Eipschitz who was a preacher, a teacher in Prague, and then later became a famous rabbi in Germany, also a great author. And he accused Rabbi Yonis and Eibshitz of being a secret follower of Shabtai Tzvi, the false messiah who in the 17th century caused havoc in the Jewish world and then converted to Islam. And after his death, there were still followers of Shabtai Tzvi. And Rabbi Yaakov Emden, who's known as the Yaivitz, Rabbi Yaakov, Yaakov Ben Tzvi, because his father's name was Rabbi Tzvi, Rabbi Tzvi Ashkenazi, the Chacham Tzvi. So the Yaivitz, Rabbi Yaakov Emden, accused Rabbi Yoinus and Apeshitz, well known for his work, Yoris Dvash, in being a secret Shabbat, Shabbat Tzvinik. And the fighting went on for a very long time. It split the communities, the government got involved. It was a horrible, horrible war. Thousands of people were involved until it, it recited. Rabbi Yaakov Hemden was convinced Rabbi Yonis and Eibshitz was, was innocent. And they say that they asked Rabbi Yaakov Hemden after it was all over, tell us, was the machleikas l'shem shamayim, was the fight for the sake of heaven, was it really idealistic? Was it really for the truth? Or was it maybe driven by other agendas? And Rabbi Yaakov Hemden said, in the beginning, it was maybe L'Shem Shamayim. In the beginning of it, it was maybe for God's purpose. For God. Maybe. Later, he admitted. Once you're in a, he admitted that there were other agendas. Once you're involved in a fight, you can't trust yourself anymore because your ego is now on the line. In the beginning, maybe it was idealistic. This Darizal says is the meaning of this posse. It's the fighting in your cities. It's the lack of peace. 
but sometimes the cause of terrible calamities. And what you have to do is, Vakamta, you must rise up. Go beyond your ego. Valisa, reach a state of Jerusalem consciousness, a state of love, a state of unity, a state of mutual respect to rebuild the wall, the fortress that doesn't allow negative energy to come in to the Jewish home and to the Jewish community. Have a wonderful and loving week. Thank you.